You are in the trenches fighting in World War I, a bullet whizzes right past your ear as someone just tried to shoot your head off. You're running to take cover in another trench as a bomb was set off near where you were. The friends that you were with have all been hit except for you, even though you have survived and don't have any mortal wounds or fractured bones. There is one thing that is fractured though, your mind. Your mind has split apart from your body because it can't bear to witness any more carnage. You are now shell-shocked. Hello everyone, my name is Punzi and welcome to this possible series where I show you the worst of the worst your own body and mind has to offer. I'm still not entirely sure what I'm going to name this series, but if you have an idea, leave it down in the comments below. I'm also trying to reach a thousand subscribers, so if that is something that you can help me out, that would be really appreciated. With that said, let's dive into today's topic. This is a picture of a man smiling hysterically dirtied up and covered in mud from the many weeks of being crammed in the trenches, his sanity fleeting his gleaming eyes. One can only imagine how much death he had to witness for his eyes to also be dead. For the most part, everyone has seemed to believe that this guy is suffering from shell shock. So what is being shell shocked? To start off, let's quickly paint a scenario these soldiers were finding themselves in. It's World War I, and it's a significant time where many countries were experimenting with new high-tech explosives, that of which the Western Front has never seen before. So as a result of this, many people were dying left and right, burned bodies were scattered all around soldiers, the only thing they could do was to hope that they weren't going to be the next victims. Contradictory to what most of you guys might think, shell shock isn't only when somebody barely gets nicked by a bullet or someone barely avoids a bombshell, which causes them to be mentally disturbed. Sure that may play a part of it, but in reality, there's just so much other factors. It could have been the weeks of not eating, the weeks of not sleeping, the constant bombarding of bombs and the loud noises, as well as the many friends they have lost throughout the time. They all could have combined to push the soldiers over the edge. So to say that they're this way simply because of a bullet or a bombshell missing is not entirely accurate. Symptoms of shell shock included fatigue, tremors, confusion, nightmares, and impaired sight and hearing, as well as neurosis. The falling may be difficult to watch, but we're going to go over the victims of shell shock and their symptoms. Here is one person who had shell shock. He was suffering from amnesia and word deafness. Even though he wasn't technically deaf, he would not understand the words they would tell him. However, there was one word he would never forget. This is his reaction when his caretaker says the word, bombs. Here's another one who was suffering from constant facial twitching. Like the previous victim, this man was also suffering from facial twitching. After a bomb exploded near him, basically burying him alive, this victim had difficulty walking without a hysterical gait, swaying movements, and nose wiping. The falling victims all suffered difficulty walking as a result of a bombshell exploding near them or a spinal concussion when that explosive pushed them back. This one had facial neurosis due to the traumas he had to witness in the war. Finally, this one is a showing of a victim who what the medical center claimed he had a hysterical pseudomuscular paralysis. So as you can see, the term shell shock was really a loose term that encompassed many symptoms. It got to the point where the military officials as well as the medical officials tried banning the use of the word because it wasn't really medically helpful. But aside from that little debate though, medical and military establishment were now facing a huge problem of the likes they had never seen before. By the end of 1915, Britain had suffered around half a million casualties, 13,000 of those casualties were experiencing shell shock. Within that 13,000, the less severe cases were treated on the spot, but the more severe ones had to be sent back to a medical center in Britain because they just could not keep on fighting in the war. They really needed help. The noisy mental cases, as Britain's army would call them, were basically sent to mental asylums because they were treated as if they were lunatics. At the time, they had no idea what was causing it or who was more susceptible to it, which leads to the next part of the video. How do you even treat something that you don't even know what it is? Well, depending on what country you looked in, treatment varied. Yes, at first, they were all treated as lunatics, but it wasn't until they finally separated the shell shock victims from actual lunatics that they were able to test out possible treatments. In Britain's Royal Victoria Military Hospital in Nettie Hampshire, 
The first order was to give those who were twitching a basic massage, milk diet, and rest. Basically, they were just waiting out to see if they got any better. Fun fact, the footage that you just saw all came from this establishment. If that didn't work, then surprisingly, they would do something along the lines that we may do for patients today who have suffered from traumatic events. They would psychoanalyze their nightmares and dreams to find the root cause of their problems. Of course, this would be taxing for both doctors and patients. I mean, there was one account where one patient had difficulty explaining his trauma. He was crying, shaking, convulsing, yelling, but when the doctors finally hit the core of his trauma, they had discovered that he had witnessed a tank mowing over wounded soldiers. There was no other way, that tank needed to move forward, and unfortunately for the wounded soldiers who couldn't move out of the way, they were crushed to death. And that soldier had witnessed everything. So this was obviously traumatizing to watch, and also traumatizing to hear for the doctors. While this method was effective, it took way too long for them to get better. The armies needed their soldiers back and ready to fight now. In Germany, they had success with hypnosis and the power of suggestment. But in France, they had the most fast and effective treatment called electroshock therapy. They would use this therapy by convincing the patients that they were not mute, they were not paralyzed, or whatever other type of disorder that patient had. By shocking the affected limbs, they would effectively show that, that this problem was just in their minds. Almost all of those who were treated were cured. That treatment was so successful that everyone around the world would use that method. A man in Britain by the name of Dr. Lewis Yelland was so advanced with this method that in one of his memoirs, he recounted a treatment of a 24-year-old soldier who after fighting in World War I for three years, he became mute for nine months and couldn't even utter a single word. Yelland would strap him in a chair and stick an electric probe in his mouth where he would not let the soldier leave until he would speak some words. Shock after shock after shock, when this soldier would not speak, every time he would slowly raise the voltage of each shock. By the end of that night though, he was able to repeat the day of the week. Even though each country had its own way of treating shell shock victims, that clinic in Nettie Hampshire would really give a mixture of any of these, depending on what the patient had. Here are some of the patients after being treated in that clinic. For those who were not cured, or for those who didn't seem relatively normal, sympathy for them from society would grow less and less. The line became more blurred and blurred to the point where they were just seen as lunatics. During the actual war, they were even treated worse. Many war officials believed that a person suffering from shell shock was either lying or too weak. A man is supposed to control his feelings, and these people were not doing that. If you were seen shaking or trembling, and you didn't want to continue fighting, there was a good chance that you would be sentenced to death for cowardice. For example, there was one account by the name of Harry Farr, who after fighting in the war since the very beginning, he was suffering from severe shell shock. He couldn't even write the update letters he would send to his family. A nurse had to do it for him. Even though he was clearly sick, the army still forced him to continue fighting in the trenches. When he told his marshal that he could not keep on going, he was court-martialed and he was sentenced to death by a firing squad. His family would later receive a letter saying that he was shot for being a coward. So this was a horrible time for shell shock victims to be alive. But it's thanks to soldiers like them that we are able to do the things that we do now. So at the end I have nothing but respect and appreciation for everyone who has fought. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching my video. In reality, I just wanted any type of excuse to show you guys this footage. I found this extremely interesting and I hope you guys also did. Just a heads up, I'm going to be experimenting with my channel. I want to be starting series here and there just to see what people like. And I hope you guys end up liking them. Thanks again for watching and I hope I get to see you guys later. Peace.